years, a friend of mine and I would get together at the Shaw Festival in Canada. We'd rent a nice room at a really nice inn and take in as many plays as the two of us could manage. One of the things we really liked about the inn was that it was owned by a German couple who served a fantastic gourmet breakfast every morning. They had a long table in their dining room and breakfast was a command performance. Uwe would go around yelling, breakfast, come to breakfast, and he'd ply us with house-made croissants. He liked to call them man-made croissants and various other kinds of really wonderful food. And we went back there year after year because the whole experience was so wonderful. But part of what we really liked about about the experience was the conversations. So we'd have this long table and usually six to eight other, six to eight couples and have these great conversations about how we'd spent our time, what we were going to do the next day, what plays we were going to see, what wineries had been visited, what activities were going on, what was going on in our lives. And when this topic of hospitality came up, I was thinking about what if the conversation at the bed and breakfast took on the attitudes of American political discourse? Ew, you drink wine? That's what a waste of time. Oh my God, you don't drink wine? What's wrong with you? What kind of Philistine are you that you don't drink wine? All the plays are the same. That's really stupid to go. How can you come here and not go to all the plays? I actually can't really imagine engaging another adult like that, and yet that's the way we often engage each other in political discourse in the United States, especially on social media. You know, welcome to the United States where the Democrats are stupid and the Republicans are immoral, or vice versa. So I was thinking about what made these conversations so good on the other hand, and thinking about what if we brought the same attitudes to politics, to political discussions, that we bring to breakfast when we're having breakfast at a nice bed and breakfast with the good food and nice company. And so I was thinking that what it takes then is genuine curiosity about the other person, an openness to conversation, an assumption of similarities among the people talking to each other, and civility. So what I mean by genuine curiosity is what if we really wanted to know why the other person feels the way they feel? Um, my friends know that I lived in Ohio for a while and I didn't really like it. And a lot of times at the bed and breakfast, I'd meet people from Ohio and I would never say to them, ooh, you're from Ohio. <laughs> I'd say so. Tell me what you like about living in Toledo. How are things going in Dayton right now? Tell me more about the Air Force Base. How's it doing? And so you try to draw somebody out into a conversation. What if we brought that same attitude to political discussions and said, you know, what's going on for, with you right now? How do, why do you feel that way? I saw a um, video recently by Robert Reich where he talked about approaching opponents civilly and with genuine curiosity. But then he also turned it almost immediately to how to convince that opponent of one's own opinion. What if we weren't looking to convince the opponent of our opinion, or even really thinking of them as an opponent, but rather just really to see where they come from? If we're not willing to talk to each other, then it lessens the conversation, really. Um, the idea also of openness to conversation in the first place. One of the things that was nice about the bed and breakfast was that we were all at a table together. But at the same time, if you try to apply that to political discourse, as Americans, we're raised to believe that you don't discuss politics, money, or religion, because those are such sources of discord People basically have their position and they're not going to move. At the same time, those are three things that are critically important to us. And if we only discuss politics during using slogans at election time, then we're not really discussing politics. We don't really get a sense of this item that is very important. Democracy is meant to be based on deliberation. And deliberation 
goes beyond slogans. So the very idea that it's not polite to discuss politics stands in the way of having a conversation with somebody else about politics. So the openness to having a conversation keeps us fr from eating breakfast at tables by ourselves. Also, the assumption of similarities. So I'll admit that this was a very nice bed and breakfast, um, and so there were certainly some uh, social and economic similarities. Also, people go to Niagara-on-the-Lake to attend the Shaw Festival, so people tended to be there either for the plays or for the wineries, so we could assume that we were there for the same reason. It turns out that there are actually some very strong similarities among Americans in terms of political values. So Jonathan Haidt, a psychologist, points out that of the five strong values, two of them, fairness, reciprocity, and harm slash care, are shared across the board, across the political spectrum by Americans as fundamental political values. You then have authority, loyalty, and purity, which are much more strongly held by conservatives than by liberals, but which also show up as values that are held by liberals, even though they're not held as strongly. So if we assume that we have certain things in common, then we've identified common ground where we can begin a discussion. I think it's also important to keep in mind the idea of civility, the idea of being polite to the person you're talking to. And I think today, especially on social media, we're seeing a very strong lack of civility. Um, people like to have discussions using memes, um, and pretty much they want to post their meme and walk away from it. And any discussion or any request for justification is seen often um, as an attack and responded to with hostility. I respond to memes. I get myself in trouble that way. So, you know, the meme that says that Iceland elected the first woman president. Yeah, tell that to the Israelis in India. Um, the meme that says that the United States is the only country that doesn't have a comprehensive health care si system. Also not true. It's also not the only place in the Western world where comprehensive health care is under attack. So I respond to memes, and I usually get a hostile response to my response to the memes. And I've noticed also that I'm not always able to be civil myself. I recently had a conversation with a dear friend where we were talking about the welfare system. And she said that women who wanted welfare benefits should agree to be sterilized in order to receive those benefits. I was outraged, and I responded very sharply. Um, and my friend was very offended by my response. So we both left, the conversation shut down, we both left angry and offended, and neither one of us really benefited from that conversation. So I wonder, in retrospect, if I had been able to respond by asking her with genuine curiosity where that idea came from for her and why she felt that way, if we might have had a better conversation. I might not have convinced her of anything, and she might not have convinced me of anything, but we both might have learned more about how the other one felt about poverty, privacy, and population control. And we might both have benefited from that. There is actually research that says that suggesting that people be more civil in their political discussions is a waste of time, that it's just pointless to say that, oh, you should be more polite. What I find, however, though, is that when I model that behavior, when I am myself more civil to others, I get a more civil response from others. And so I think that I will continue to try to uh, approach political discussions as if I were at a bed and breakfast. And maybe, you know, if we all did that, we might discover that Republicans aren't stupid and Democrats aren't immoral. <laughs>